So today we are very happy to have uh, Itzio Yo Yo uh, from PCTS Princeton. And uh, uh, he's a postdoc fellow there, and his topics are related to the uh, topic, uh, this, uh, the topic the workshop on Tuesdays about the fractal. And uh, uh, the topic is on emergent fractal and algebraic quantum physics from quantum melting transitions. And thank you. So let's welcome Itzio. Transition is now with two pioneer Jim B and Mike Flatpole. I guess most of you have already attended their talks on seminars in the CMSA workshop or program. And I will also slightly mention some recent work work about the emerging fractal at the point of critical point. It's the work of held by Matt Coleman and his group members. So because most of you have already attended uh, CMSA workshop uh, yesterday and today. And there was a fractal section, uh, section, so I assume I don't need to have too much happy introduction on what does fractal mean. So, in short, uh, fractal actually refers to a new type of quasi particle which has restrict mobilities. And to be precise, that means such kind of quasi particle they still have to be decomfined quasi particle, which means if I create a particle and it's and a particle partner and spatially separate. Them apart, this shouldn't cost a uh, divergent energy cost. However, the quasi particle itself, although they are decomplined and they can emerge at the low energy spectrum, turns out to be immobile, which means it is impossible to move a single quasi particle without going through an energy barrier. Or if we really want to move some of the quasi particles, sometimes they have to move them in group and uh, they have restricted mobility, which usually means. They are restricted on a submanifold, like a 2D, like 1D, uh, 1D row, or even a 3D fractal degree of freedom. And usually, the reason why such kind of quasi particle has restricted mobility or sub dimensional behavior is the fractal quasi particle usually carries some quantum number, and the quantum number is not just conserved globally, the quantum number is conserved on a submanifold, like a 2D plane. And that is why when we move these kind of quasi particles, they are only allowed to. So this, this, this is a stable object. True, true. And they have, in the ideal case, they actually have a very long lifetime. And uh, there are a lot of quasi particles, but the, their mobility is not somehow constrained. And if you really want to move them out of their restricted mobility, you have to go through a finite energy barrier, which is usually not favored at low temperature or zero temperature. But if you assume this table, it means that your Laplacian table cannot have quite right return. Yeah, exactly. So you don't have a kinetic term, a quadratic a kinetic term. Instead, you will have a quadratic term or even higher order terms. Do you have any idea to freedom my style with zero with quite right term? But this quite right term, I can argue that in some range it's irrelevant to operate. So it's surprised. And I can get the theory. You mean, in, you mean I have emergent subsystems? I, I mean, if uh, like Lamji, usually in quantum physics, we ignore some term because this term is irrelevant mm -hmm. by some scale. So usually, quite, at least for 2D or higher, the quadratic term is relevant. So, so yeah, it's relevant. So whether there could be some situation that you, you have some theory, make a very weird situation that this quadratic term irrelevant. True. So if I say that in a quantum field, there is such kind of quadratic term of cannot, uh, a leading order kinetic term is irrelevant, that means such kind of term actually can be flow to zero, and that means actually your ion theory has some emergent subsystem symmetry. That is why we only consider high order, high order term. And emergent subsystem symmetry, if it's really emergent, then they can only appear in some quantum critical point of, or some algebra liquid phase. In a gap phase of matter, usually emer uh, emergent subsystem symmetry or whatever emergent global symmetry is impossible. So if the quadratic term irrelevant, then they can only appear as some point to point, like a point critical point. Oh, you do have questions. So although the 
terminology fractal was just uh, introduced uh, three years ago. Actually, the fractal behavior already exists in decades, and such kind of fractal behavior can even exist in some classical system like uh, liquid crystals or plastic theories. So imagine we have a crystal crystalline phase where we have a bunch of atoms and they finally form a lattice, like a 2D square lattice. And for such kind of crystalline phase, we can have some extrinsic defect, like a dislocation defect, where a chain of atoms just terminate at some point. And here, this is a dislocation defect, which carries a burger vector, burger's vector, which goes in the direction perpendicular to the atom chain's termina termination directions. So for such kind of dislocation defect, we can actually move by gliding them in a direction which is parallel to the Burgers vector direction because we can just take this chain of atom and uh, glide them in this direction. To uh, This actually effectively removes this dislocation because what we need to do is we just need to break the bond here and we order the bond in the other direction. This effectively moves the dislocation in a direction parallel to the Burgers vector. But if we want to move them in the opposite direction, we want to climb such kind of dislocation feedback, which means I have to move this dislocation in a direction which is perpendicular to the Burgers vector. Then what I need to do is I actually need to enlarge or shrink this chain of atom. And if I have such kind of climbing process, before the chain of atom only contains four atoms, but once I climb it, it only contains three atoms, so such kind of climbing process actually change the atom number. So if I have a liquid crystal system with conserved number of atoms, then such kind of process can never appear. And that actually means if I have conserved number of atoms in the solids, solid systems, the dislocation defect is a subdimensional particle. It can only glide or it can only move in a direction parallel to its Burgers vector, but there is no way to move them in the direction perpendicular to the Burgers vector. And this is a very typical example where a classical system, its extrinsic feedback has a subdimensional mobility. Excuse me, sorry, just make sure I understand this climb. Mm -hmm. Can you briefly mention why, why this is this a law? Uh, because here you are, climb means you have to enlarge or shrink this chain. Right. And this actually take out or you have to import more atoms okay. to the system. Okay. For Otherwise you need to pull out a boundary or something. Yes. You cannot do it locally. You have to take this out and yeah. then you actually climb it. Or you have to take one atom here and this will climb it down. But for conserved number of atoms, this is impossible. So this is just a classical example. And a fractal behavior is not uh, about a quasi particle because the dislocation is more like an extrinsic defect. And the liquid crystal the dislocation should be gone as a confined excitation, which is not a quasi particle. So, so is the crime? Uh, prohibited even in the infinite volume limit, or uh, is it special for finite system? Mm, uh, yeah, it's so, that prohibition, yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's finite. Actually, I'm going into the thermodynamic limit, so mm. the climb is always prohibited if the number of atoms in a solid is conserved. I see, okay. I just want to be clear. You said this look like confined object. Uh, yeah, this location okay, is confined in liquid crystal phase. Because if you want to spatially separate them apart, you will have to cause the energy which is linear with the, with the see, spatial separation. So it's not a decomplied quasi particle. And the next question is can fractal really appear in a quantum many body systems, or can fractal really appear as a decomplied quasi particle rather than some kind of classical defect? And the answer is yes. If you attend a workshop on Tuesday afternoon, there are a bunch of discussion about fractal phase of matter and uh, the search for fractal actually came from some exactly soluble quantum spin models or quantum fermion models known as stabilizer code and they can further extend to some page net model which I want to mention today. So these are quantum systems and uh, these are exactly soluble models which involve some complicated spin interaction or fermion interactions. And because they are exactly soluble one can figure out that such kind of Phase of matter really supports some kind of deep compact quasi particle which has restricted mobilities. But I will not focus on such kind of quantum systems today because these are 
simple and beautiful exactly solved model, but they are really complicated, abstract, and they are far from reality. What I'm looking for is wonder whether we can have some realistic condensed matter systems whose quasi particles manifest such kind of fraud behavior. Or can we start from some well known condensed matter system like first rate magnet or some uh, uh, or some paramagnetic crystals and, and figure out whether such kind of paramagnetic crystals could display such kind of emergent quantum behavior. So actually we have two platforms which manifest such kind of quantum excitations. And one is the melting transition of a okay, paramagnetic crystal, which I will mention today. And the other is the form critical region between the high order TI and the atomic insulator, where at a form critical point, the subsystem symmetry is really emergent, which means if I add a very small and weak quadratic term, such kind of quadratic term can turn out to be irrelevant. So here, you really have an emergent subsystem symmetry or emergent fractal behavior as such kind of form count. Uh, if, if we have a Laplacian and a fractal, and do the integration and to see the isotopic range, the energy density integration, so usually infinity, right? So your structure, because you say separate is linear. Energy. Uh, then, that's, uh, then that's a confined excitation. Yes. My point is that if you write out a for fractal, do such computation, and then go to the asymptotic range, and the energy, I think the calculation tells us the energy should be infinity. Right? No, I don't know why. Okay. I, 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 I know from the the Laplange, the I tried that calculation since the infinity. Uh, so I just want to say. I mean, I give a Lagrangian, I can write yeah, out. But which Lagrangian are you talking about for different fractal systems with different subsystems symmetry and different Lagrangian? Okay. Um, I don't know if that's that subject. The, the, the Lagrangian are done from Juan's Lagrangian. Juan have a Lagrangian about that. And uh, I can write out the energy density for that. Then I do a computation for, for the integration, go to the infinity range. The whole integration, I find the infinity. So, but I'm not talking about his theory. Oh, yeah, I know you don't. Sorry. I'm sorry. I just want a possibility to ask you with the such a question. Actually, he's talking about PhD, but I'm talking about that. Okay. Right, my comment just, I mean, for electrodynamics, even if you have a charge positive and negative pulled far away, I mean, incident charge density will also diverge. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But, but then the thing is that the you just said this configuration causes a lot of energy, but you can distribute charge in certain way. The energy can be finite. So it depends on what's the charge distribution. Also depends on the context of matter. So so th those are the details one can sort of. But I think it's will talk a particular case. Yeah, that's an interesting question, but uh, maybe discuss later. Please give me six. So first, let's look at a paramagnetic crystal case. Uh, 2D spiralized, if I have a one spin, one half per side or half. If I have odd number of spin per side, then there are two typical paramagnetic crystal configuration, which doesn't break any spin rotation symmetry, but they break the lattice C4 translation symmetry. Uh, one typical candidate is called a valence bond solid, where the two spins form a spin singlet on a bond, and this is a dimer configuration. Such kind of valence bond solid still preserves the SU2 rotation symmetry, but it breaks the uh, lattice uh, C4 rotation symmetry and also breaks the translation symmetry in one direction. Another typical paramagnetic crystal which one can imagine is already observed in a bunch of material is called a valence Plaquet solid phase where the four spin entangled in a symmetric way and at a corner of a square Plaquet. And such kind of valence bond solid also preserves the spin symmetry but it breaks the side center C4 rotation symmetry and it also breaks the translation symmetry in both directions. But now the unit cell is doubled in both Tx and Ty direction. And these are called paramagnetic crystal because there is no magnetic order, but there are crystal line order because the that is C4 and translation symmetry are all broken. And if we want to restore the lattice symmetry, which is already broken here, what we need to do is we need to drive a quantum melting transition of these paramagnetic crystals. And there was a mathematical theorem called the Hastings theorem or Oshikawa theorem, which said that if we melt such kind of paramagnetic crystal, 
there's, it is impossible for you to get a feature that's got a paramagnetic phase because you will only have one spin and one pump per unit cell. And uh, further reason for which prohibit you to go into a featureless paramagnetic gap to place is if we want to melt such kind of paramagnetic crystal, what we need to do is we need to proliferate the defect of these valence bond solid or valence plaque solids. And the defect of such kind of UVS or valence plaque solid always carries some non trivial quantum. It actually carries a spin off. So now let's first look at the valence bond solid phase. For the VBS order parameter, it actually it corresponds to a dimer configuration, which they on one of the bond, and they break the lattice C4 rotation symmetry. And there are actually four distinct valence bond solid configuration because the dimer can live on four distinct bond. So we can regard this VBS order parameter as a Z4 boson and in the valence bond solid phase, actually such kind of Z4 boson condensates, so we have a favored bond di uh, direction. Then if you want to melt or kill such kind of VPS phase, what we need to do is we need to proliferate the defect of this Z4 boson. And in 2D, the Z4 boson has a defect, which is actually a vortex, where the four distinct valence bond solid configuration meet at a singular point. And at the center of the singular point, we have a free spin around configure of freedom, which is not paired with anyone else. So the vortex defect of this Z4 boson carries a spin on four And if we want to restore the spatial symmetry, what we need to do is we need to proliferate and condense such kind of vortex configuration, which will potentially restore the C4 rotation symmetry and the translation symmetry. However, because the vortex core here carries a spin on one when you condense the defect, you are in the meantime condense the spin on as well. And the defect condensate will restore the crystalline symmetry, but the spin on condensate will always give you a magnetic order, like a new order phase. So, such kind of condensate would, would do two jobs at the same time. It will restore the, it will break the valence bond solid configuration and restore the crystalline symmetry. But the condensate of the spin on in the middle would also break the magnetic spin rotation symmetries. And hence, there could be a continuum and direct phase transition between a valence bond solid and a magnetic order, like a new order. And such kind of quantum critical point of phase transition is pretty well studied by the Boston and St. Bala. The quantum critical point is called what they call the deconfined quantum critical point, described by the non compact CP1 theory. The theory, the quantum Decomplied as the instant on event becomes irrelevant, becomes dangerous, irrelevant. And that is why the spin off at the upper quantum critical region becomes decomplied. So, this is how we restore the uh, crystalline symmetry and get the magnetic, and magnetic symmetry breaking state, like a new order state from a valence bond solid. And then let's look at what should happen if we have a valence plaque solid. For valence plaque solid, it breaks the side center C4 rotation symmetry and it breaks the translation symmetry in both directions. There are four distinct valence bond solid configuration because the plaque and they appear here, here, and here, and they are related by a C4 rotation. So we can still somehow write such kind of valence plaque solid as a Z4 boson to work with them. And in a solid place, this Z4 boson condensate, so we have a flavor of plaque configuration. And if we want to melt such kind of valence plaque solid, what we need to do is we need to proliferate the C4 boson defect, which is still a vortex in 2D. And this is a typical vortex configuration where four distinct valence plaque solid configuration meet at a single point. And again, at a single point, we have a spin one half in our freedom, which is not paired with any of the any of the plaque nearby. So such kind of vortex core still carries a spin on one of them. And naively, when you might assume the story will still be the same. Once I proliferate such kind of defect, I'm restoring the translation C for rotation symmetry, but because it carries a spin on the ground freedom, so in the meantime, I will eventually break the, break the magnetic symmetry and go into some magnetic order phase. But here, we have to have to be more precise. What does it mean by condensed, which kind of defect carries a spin on the world freedom? 
when I say something condensed, first it should be boson. Second, there are usually two prerequisites of a condensing process. First, if I say some boson or composite particle can condensate, they must be energetically deconfined, which means spatially separate quasi particle and its anti quasi particle here uh, cost a divergent energy cost. And in the valence well, uh, Planck solid phase, such kind of defect is a confined excitation. But once you approach the quantum critical point, such kind of energy cost is softened, and eventually at a quantum critical region, the spin on is a deconfined excitation. A second, when I say a particle can condensate, then it must have some kinetic energy, which means particle could be free to fluctuate in space time. And uh, the problem is, even at a quantum critical point, such kind of feedback carries a spin on degree of freedom is energetically deconfined. It doesn't carry any kinetic energy, and there is no way for it for it to fluctuate alone in space time. Excuse me, just make sure I follow. So, in each uh, vertex on the side, we have a spin one half degree of freedom, <laughs> and so spin is the excitation of spin one half, and then the Z four boson. Do you mean the pairing? Uh, Z four boson means actually this plug K order whether the plug is leading here, here, and here. Okay, I see. So that's the valence plug K solid uh, order pair with Z four boson. And the, the full spin on this uh, square are paired in a certain way. Yes. So if you want the SU two symmetric uh, valence plug K solid, then this plug K correspond to a superposition of two horizontal diver plus okay. two vertical okay. diver. And if you want to release, I only need a unique plan. You want symmetry plus time reversal symmetry, and they can just maximum entangle as one O one O plus O one O one state something like that. Okay. Yeah. You mean the single diamond pairing? Single. That's okay. That's true. Uh, no, that only has U one symmetry plus okay. time reversal symmetry. So what's the pairing of the diamond? What's the pairing? You have a this and this pairing, right? Yeah. What's the pairing for the speed? Diver is a singlet. Singlet, yeah, that's one. Okay, singlet. So first, let's see what why a spin-on can fluctuate in the background of a fluctuating diver. So if I have a spin-on excitation here and I want to move it to any of the sublattice, what I need to do is I just need to exchange the spin-on degree of freedom with the nearby diver configuration. So what I need to do is this. I just uh, exchange the location between the spin-on and this diver. Or if I want to move it in this in this direction, then I just need to exchange this spin on this, this time. And this this virtually change actually effectively moved the spin on out, and the spin on must be fluctuated on the same sublattice. However, if you have a plug A fluctuating plug A pattern, then the spin on fluctuation becomes very subtle. Because if I want to exchange the spin on with the location of this plug A, what I will end up is a configuration like this. And uh, there's an obstruction here because for this spin, there are two plug A nearby. But uh, for the plug A order, we assume one spin is only entangled with one of the plug A nearby. So such kind of configuration is never allowed in a long geospheric space. And that means such kind of spin on fluctuating is never allowed. And actually, this obstruction holds. No matter how you move the spin on out, you will eventually go into a obstruction such that there is a configuration and there is an obstructed site where there are two or even more plugging nearby. And that actually means the spin on is really stuck here. The spin on should really be stuck in the middle like a front on. It cannot move to any other direction. Uh, even the spin on is stuck here, it doesn't mean it's a glassy system. Although a single spin on cannot fluctuate in space, we can somehow look for some collective mode. We can try to see whether a pair of spin on can be moved together. So, if we have a pair of spin on spatially separate along this bond, this is what I call a diver degree of freedom uh, or, or dipole degree of freedom. And actually, this dipole can be moved in a 1D direction, which is perpendicular to the dipole's orientation. If I want to move these two together, in this direction, what I need to do is I just need to exchange the location with this plug in nearby. So this virtual process effectively moves a pair of spin-on as a dipole in a direction perpendicular to their orientation. 
Now, this is the only mobility they can have. There's no way for you to further move this dipole pair in the direction which is parallel to their orientation. Otherwise, you will again reach some obstruction that there are two or even more flapping near one side. So, so uh, could you go back to the last one? So, for this configuration, uh, where the two spins nearby form a singlet, and then if you condense this configuration, then it should not break a uh, spin rotation symmetry anymore. That depends on what kind of interaction you have. If you have yeah. an interferomagnetic interaction, you will break your fiber configuration. But what I'm considering is you have exact subsystem symmetry on EV hometown, which means the spin only have brain exchange term. There is no spin by linear interaction term between them. So okay. single and true spin are of the same energy, they will go into a dynamic state. So the take home message is in such kind of plaque background, you see that a single spin on. Uh, it's really a fractal, it's stuck inside, and there's no way for you to move them out of it. They cannot fluctuate in space. Instead, a pair of spin on can gain some collective motion, uh, but there are sub dimensional particles. They're almost something like a winding particle. Is. The spin on pair can only fluctuate on the same stripe, which is perpendicular to the, to the dipole's orientation. So, this is just a superficial and pictorial way to show that the spin on is really a fractal. And the spin on as a pair, of, as a dipole, is a subdimensional winding particle. In order to be precise, we probably have to show that the spin on is really a fractal because such kind of plaque configurations can be mapped into a higher engaged unit. Excuse me. So let me just make sure. So, like this restriction, is this the same kind of a uh, a system that uh, this uh, Labin and Central they have for this uh, VBS. Uh, yeah, they are uh, considering VBS to new transition. But Euro is dimer. Yeah, Deep, that is dimer. This is plug -in. So it's different. It's plug -in. Okay. So they don't have that restriction. Euro is okay. Thank you. So as a warm up, let's first review how a dimer configuration is mapped into a 2D U1 compact U1 gauge theory. So this is just the story of the one dimer model on the bipartite lattice. On the bipartite lattice, like a square lattice, on each bond, if we have a diver occupancy, we can always map this diver occupancy into an electrical field living on the link. So if I have a diver here, that corresponds to the fact that the electrical field here has a value which is 1 or minus 1, depending on the sub-lattice factor. And if there's no diver cover here, then the electric field here is just a zero. And from our Hilbert space, because we know we only have one spin, one half per side, there is a Hilbert constraint such that if there's one dimer near per side, then there's no free spin. If there are no dimers adjacent to the side, then I have a free spin on here. To translate such kind of constraint, we can write down a Gauss law for such kind of electric field, such that the gradient of the electric field correspond to a sublattice structure vector. 1 minus the spin on number here. So this Gauss law is nothing but tell you that if there are no dimer nearby, I have no free spin on. Otherwise, if there is one dimer nearby, then there's, it is charge neutral here. So is that E field is uh, nothing but a field strength of the non compact CP1 description? Uh, but here, the gauge field, uh, I haven't talked about gauge field, but here it is compact. I the see. reason it's non compact is if the instanton event turns out to be irrelevant, mm -hmm. then actually compact and non compact doesn't make too much difference. So I at see. the base, it is compact, so instanton is relevant, mm -hmm. but only at a one critical point, the instanton becomes irrelevant, and that is why we can call it non compact. I see, okay. In the 2D, the compact U1 gauge theory without metaphor is always confined because instanton is always relevant. So this Gauss law, because we have a Gauss law that actually implies that the charge, the spin-on charge is conserved globally. So whenever we create spin-on excitation by breaking a dimer pair, the spin-on has to appear in pair. And even there are spatially separate parts, there must be two or even number of spin-on for the, for the whole year of space. And because the electric field corresponds to the valence bond of dimer coverage here, the conjugate operator, the gauge connection, gauge field, actually correspond to a creation, a annihilation operator of a dimer at a link. And then the lowest order gauge invariant operator, which is the magnetic flux operator, correspond to the fluctuation of the dimer configuration. If we add, 
and the magnetic flux operator on the plug head will fluctuate and uh, flip to horizontal diver into two vertical <coughs> diver and vice versa. And if we have a single spinner which can correspond to the charged ground freedom, and if we want to move them here, what we need to do is we need to annihilate the spin-off here, create here, and along the path where the spin-off moves, what we need to do is we have to reorder the diamond configuration. We have to annihilate diamond here and create diamond here. And in the spin theory language, that corresponds to we have a spin-off operator, and its current operator should minimal couple with the gauge field. And the role of the gauge field is it has to reorder the diamond configuration along the path where the spin-off moves. Now let's go back to the plug head case. And to me, there's only one type of plug head on the XY plane. So at each plug head center, we can define an electric, something like a tensor electric field, EXY field. In 2D, there's only one electric field, which corresponds to the valence plug head coverage. So if there's one plug head here, then this electric field has value either one or minus one, depending on the supplied structure factor. And if there's no plug A here, then the electric field is just zero. And again, we have an intrinsic constraint coming from here in space. For each side, if there's one plug A nearby, then we don't have any free spin on. If there are no plug A nearby, then we have one free spin. To translate such kind of constraint into a Gauss law language, now what we can write is we can write a special Gauss law, such that there are two partial derivatives acting on the electric field. And, uh, this is just a simple translation of your here of space. And because this special Gauss law has two partial derivatives, what we will find is the charge QR here is not just conserved globally. Instead, if we integrate out this equation along whatever row or whatever column, you'll find the charge on each row and each column is also conserved. And this is what I call a subsystem symmetry. And because you have this charge conservation on rows and columns, when I create a charge, they are not just a free in pair. Instead, they must be pure in a quartet form. I must have four charges at the same time. Two of them should live on the same row. Two of them should live on the same columns. And once I want to move them or fluctuate this charge, it is impossible to move one charge in whatever direction. Otherwise, we are ch changing the charge conservation form of the charge conservation on whatever row and column. Instead, the only lost order motion which is allowed or compatible with the special Gauss law is I can only move a particle hole pair as a dipole in a direction which is perpendicular to their orientation along the same stripe. That is the only motion you can imagine which, which does not violate such kind of special Gauss law. And this tensor will be symmetric tensor? Uh, yes, we, and then we only have the x y, the only off diagonal. So because the electric field corresponds to the di uh, plug A coverage, the electric field's conjugate partner, the gauge connection AXY, actually corresponds to the creation or annihilation operator for the valence plug A socket. And if I want to move this, di this dipole in a direction perpendicular to its orientation, what we are doing is actually we first annihilate this dipole pair free them here, and along the path it moves, I have to reorder the plug configurations from one sublattice to the other sublattice. And in this field theory metric language, that corresponds to a uh, dipole's current operator should minimal couple with the gauge field, and that is why whenever you are moving a dipole along the path, you have to reorder the plug configurations along the path as well. So one important message here is, here I'm always claiming that uh, the spin is really a fracton in the background of a valence plug A solid, and uh, we also provide a tensor gauge theory mapping for that. But uh, in reality, or in a concrete condensed matter system, it could be subtle. The spin is really a fracton in a valence plug A solid, only based on the fact that such kind of plug A configuration cannot be broken into a pair of horizontal or vertical diamond configuration at IR. Cannot be broken at IR, which actually means if I break such kind of plug configuration into two horizontal or vertical diamond that should cause a finite energy. Because if I can break such kind of plug configuration into two horizontal or vertical diamond without a big energy cost, what you will find is you can, I can first 
break all of the plaquette on this row into some horizontal dimers. And further, once I have dimers, I can just uh, move the channel spin on out by exchanging their location with the dimer like this. So in the plaquette ordered phase, it is true that such kind of plaquette break into dimer always cause a finite energy. So if you want to break all of these plaquette out and move out the spin on, this will create a chain of dimer which will again cause a divergent energy cost. But once you approach a point critical point, there are usually two possibilities. The first possibility is such kind of plaquette break into dimer still cause finite energy. And hence, we don't need to consider such kind of string of diamond configurations. And uh, under such kind of condition, the spin off at a point critical point is still a fraton because the diamond configuration is almost absent from pi r. And this is the case what I'm focusing on considering throughout the talk today. But there is another possibility that at a point critical point, the energy difference between a plug K and two horizontal diamond becomes softened. So at one critical point, these two configurations almost have the same energy. And then I can easily break them into a pair, uh, two diamond pairs. And once you have diamond configuration, the theory becomes similar to the diamond to new order transition. Because as long as you have diamond configuration in your low energy field of space, such spin can fluctuate freely in your field of space. So now, again, I'm focusing on a case that even at a formal critical point, the low energy here for space only can contain such kind of fluctuating plaquette configurations. So the spin-off here is still a fraction. So is the second possibility allowed because your subsystem symmetry is some only emergent symmetry? Mm, uh, here I'm considering, in the phase, I'm considering the subsystem symmetry is exact symmetry. And uh, at a formal critical point, if you have some subsystem symmetry breaking term, like spin by linear interaction, when it's weak and for hot feeling, it is irrelevant. But when it is strong, it becomes relevant. And once it is relevant, usually the plug A can be easily break into a diamond pair. And then such kind of spin up can fluctuate and you can definitely go into a mathematical order. I see, I see. So now, once the critical, at a point critical point, if the spin on is still a fractal and the leading order motion still came from a pair of spin on as a dipole, which are constrained in a 1D stripe, we can write down a minimal Gaussian theory to describe the kinetics of these spin-offs. Because a single spin-off cannot fluctuate, so the theory does not, should not have any quite, um, quadratic dispersion like dx, dy, theta, which correspond to the spin-off's own kinetics. Instead, the only leading order kinetics came from this dx, dy, theta term, which correspond to the fact that a dipole oriented in x direction can fluctuate along y, or dipole along y direction can fluctuate along x. And in the last model, such kind of dx dy theta term correspond to a ring exchange term, where I have a particle whole pair along x moving along y, or I have a particle whole pair along y where I'm moving along x. And because this is the only leading order kinetic terms, such kind of boson theory actually has a quadratic dispersion instead of a linear dispersion, and such kind of theory doesn't manifest any U1 rotation symmetry. It only has C4 symmetry, and the low energy behavior is also pretty different. In the usual linear interactive boson theory, if we just have a linear dispersion, then you only have a zero energy point at the center of at high symmetric momentum. But here, because we have this dx dy theta term, we actually have a nodal line where along these lines, we have excessive number of zero energy modes, and uh, near each momentum along the kx of ky nodal line, the theory almost behaves like a one d relativistic boson case. And as long as I fix kx of ky, it's almost a relativistic one d boson, which has a linear dispersion along the perpendicular direction. Now let's see what will happen when we have such kind of Gaussian theory. So because we have such kind of gapless boson, we can first assume whether it's possible to, for boson to condensate. And for such kind of theory, a single boson as a spin-off cannot condensate because they don't even have any kinetics. Instead, the leading order kinetics came from a dipole, which can be written as a partial phi theta, and they only fluctuate in 1D. So such kind of dipole is almost a 1D boson. And if the dipole proliferate and try to condensate, the dipole condensate does not give you any long range order symmetry breaking because, you know, for very linear theory, it tells you for 1D 
1D quantum system, if your boson has a continuous symmetry like U1 symmetry, it's called as it will not give you any long-range order because the quantum fluctuation in lower dimension is still pretty strong. Instead, such kind of dipole condensate will eventually give you a quasi long-range order between two dipoles, where if we calculate the dipole-dipole coordinate later and let them spatially separate along the stripe, then we should have a power law correlation between them. So they only have a quasi long-range order, which is pretty similar to the 1D quantum spin chains. And so eventually, once the dipole condensate, it will go into a quantum liquid phase where the dipole pair may have a power law correlation function. Such kind of liquid phase is gapless, but there is no explicit or spontaneous symmetry breaking because of the strong quantum fluctuation. So, so you just said that the global symmetry is not U1, but instead it's C4? Uh, uh, the U1 is the U1 rotation of the 2D plane. But it's, it's not, U1 is not a symmetry of the system. It's uh, spatial, it's spatial O2. But it's not a symmetry. So you have you can have a totally doesn't have. I think you mean that uh, if you only have a C4 discrete symmetry, can you apply the mean Morgan theory? Right. No, it's C4 symmetry is the spatial symmetry, but uh, internal symmetry is the, the subsystem U1 symmetry. So oh. U1 is the spatial rotation symmetry. It's not the internal symmetry. Uh, it's like uh, when you uh, are square you? lattice, you definitely have spatial U1. Uh, oh. yeah, so U1 is internal. Uh, it's the spatial O2, 2D O2 rotation symmetry. But on the it's the spatial O2 rotation symmetry, but not, the, internal. not internal. but, but on the latest, you have O2. On the latest. You only have C4, because square lines only have C4 symmetry. You don't have O2 rotation. So where do we have like U1 in the space? In the space? We don't have it. You don't have it. So, then, so how do you apply Vermeer formula? Vermeer formula doesn't depend on the spatial symmetry. But well, that is model. I just wonder where the continuous symmetry is. Because Mummy and Morgan say that no continuous symmetry is spontaneous broken. True, true, that's the subsystem you want charging. It's not spatial. Subsystem. Mummy and Morgan theory is only talking about the spatial symmetry, not talking about oh. any symmetry. Because you don't have the symmetry. Okay, but I still didn't read it. Sorry. Just, so you are applying Mummy and Morgan to, to a continuous symmetry? True, and it's actually internal charging you want symmetry. Oh, internal charge U1. Okay. There's an internal charge U1. Okay. Yeah, the symmetry which is absent is actually here on in the UV Hamiltonia, we are actually have a square lattice, so you only have C4 symmetry. And uh, when you go into IR, you still only have C4 symmetry. This is pretty different from the dimer theory because for that the dimer on a critical point, even your UV Hamiltonia, it contains only a C4 symmetry, but once you flow to IR, it actually has an enlarged U1 symmetry because for instance of the event is dangerous to relevant. And to apply Mami Wagner, so so, so quanta should have a linear dispersion relation, right? And isn't there any subtlety coming out of the zero momenta for both Kx and Ky? I don't know what you mean. So if so you consider a specific Momenta for y direction, then x dispersion is linear, and I think I can apply, you can apply Mami Wagner, but uh, for both the momenta case. Uh, True, you can, you can do that. You just uh, assume that it's going to condensate and have a gapless dispersion, a calculated correlation. And what you will find is actually there's no large, large order because of the quadratic dispersion. Quadratic but for example, ferromagnetic order is allowed, right, in one dimension. And uh, that, that, that is allowed because it has a quadratic True. dispersion, right? True. And that is why you have to calculate the correlator and see whether it's long range order. In principle, for what we're looking at here is when you talk about linear dispersion, if yeah. you have a more singular dispersion or more flat dispersion, then that could be different. I see. So because you compute it explicitly, you can. Yes. No, that I see. Yes. I see. Thank you. He was worried the x y may give you quadratic dispersion, so may, maybe it's spontaneous. It's a quadratic dispersion, but it has nodal lines. Okay. Here it's something like quadratic, but uh, if you think here on this, here are these nodal lines, like uh, fixed kx, then it's almost again like linear dispersion.
I see. So, i n f r a r e d singularity is basically dominated by those nodal ranks. I see, I see. You're actually invisible. So, finally, what we get is a form liquid phase. It's gapless, but there is no symmetry breaking. That's why we call it a liquid phase. And there's only a power law decay correlation function between dipoles on the same stripe. Such kind of liquid is a phase which is pretty stable. And for, for, for finite region where k t e n d more to be large, such kind of liquid phase always persists. However, a small k, because the theta is a compact boson, but the compact. Matters and when k becomes small, the d e b a c k proliferation operator becomes relevant. And so when k becomes small, it is possible that such kind of phase will be spontaneously gapped and be driven into a stripe order or p l u c k a t e order phase. So if we have such kind of liquid phase coming from the p l u c k a t e melting transitions, what, what one would like to do is we probably want to figure out whether there are any interesting transport signatures which can be probed in. Experiment in a lab or in a numerical simulations. So, first, in, in the lab, what we can do is if it's really a f o r m s t i n system, we can just uh, measure the structure factors. And what we will find is the structure factors also contain such kind of nodal line along the kx and ky directions. That implies that uh, there are excessive number of zero energy states along kx and ky. And this behavior is pretty similar to the exciton liquid. Where there is a boson version of the Fermi surface, because we know in 2D the Fermi surface means there is a close, close loop or close line, and along this line you have these zero energy states. And this is the boson version of that, where the zero energy state forms a close line along kx and ky, and all of them will contribute to the low energy transport behavior. So if we calculate the specific heat of such kind of liquid phase, we know for the usual. Weakly interacting boson in 2D, the specific heat just deals with the temperature in a cubic way. But for such kind of system, the specific heat is proportional to T ln T, which is pretty similar to some kind of non f e r m i liquid in two spatial dimension. And the reason why, ha- why we have such kind of special specific heat behavior is due to the excessive number of zero energy mode along this kx and ky branch. In addition, in some new words, we can plot the Ground, uh, entanglement entropy of the ground state. And for most uh, 2D gapless system, 2D quantum gapless system, the entanglement entropy still obeys the area law. But for such kind of liquid phase, what we will find is if we just make a spatial cut and calculate the entanglement entropy of the reduced density matrix for this A, the entanglement entropy scale as L l o w e r L, which violates the area law. Such kind of entanglement entropy is pretty similar to the 2D Fermi circuit theory. And the reason why we have such kind of long range entanglement is not hard to perceive. Because in the s i n g stripe limit, the dipole almost behaves like a 1D relativistic boson. And we know for the 1D relativistic boson, the entanglement entropy is single charge times low and down. And uh, now we have a, a approximately L number of stripes. And because the dipole only fluctuates within the same stripe, so the coupling of them. Does not change any kind of kinetic behavior. And what we will have is L number of 1D relativistic, relativistic boson. That's why the entanglement entropy just scales with L or L. Excuse me, sorry. Any question? So you say both Fermi surface, this is a bosonic system, but again, why, why, some, why something like Fermi surface? Uh, the reason the in previous literature, something like exciton liquid, which has the same structure factor. Both Fermi circuits, for Fermi circuits, we have a zero energy mode which forms a close loop or close line. And here it's the same. The zero yeah. energy mode forms a close line along the x axis. And it's very much a restrict motion uh, excitation? Yeah. The, yes, the because it's almost something like a one to one to this boson on each stripe. So if we fix k moment, which is something like fix the dipole lens, then it's almost a one to one to this boson. Only in two directions. Okay. Yes. And then the specific key is only. Compute the uh, uh, near zero temperature. Uh, near the temperature. Low temperature. temperature, right? Okay. A disorder, fragile to disorder. Can you make the comment again? Yeah, again. it's fragile to disorder because it's just uh, something like a one D, or one D particle, which is pretty fragile to disorder. In two D, even if they are less fragile, it's usually you have more paths to go from one one location to the other location. But here, there are some dimensional particles, so again, you only have a unique path here, and if you 
have some place where they potentially can purchase, they just cannot go across and they're just uh, localized at your original location. So as a comparison, the valence bond solid and the valence plus solid, their melting transition can be pretty different. Although both of their defect carries a spin-on degree of freedom, in the valence bond solid, the spin-on can strongly fluctuate in space-time and finally it condenses and give you a magnetic order place. But for the valence plus solid, a single spin-on cannot fluctuate alone, and the only kinetic energy came from the spin-on pair, which behave like a dipole and they only fluctuate in one D, and that is why we eventually get uh, algebra quantum liquid phase before going into a magnetic order phase. And actually, such kind of fraton behavior as a deep, uh, giving the defect of a plaque paramagnetic is pretty universal in other values or in other dimensions. So if we have a SU3 para, uh, paramagnetic plaque order phase where the free SU3 spins forms a SU3 singlet on uh, one of the three triangle facing the left directions, what you will find is actually if we have a defect by breaking one plug A into three SU3 spins, these SU3 spins are actually conserved on a 2D fractal like a shift in two triangle. And this actually implies that such kind of spin on is also immobile because whenever you move it out, you're actually violating the charge conservation law on the 2D fractal, and there's no way for you to move them together as well. So presumably such kind of Plaque melting transition will go into a glassy state. And similar, in 3D valence plaque order, a single spin on leaving a defect cannot fluctuate at all, but a pair of spin on as a dipole particle can only fluctuate within the 2D stripe. So, in some anisotropic limit, what we can expect is such kind of spin on pair condensate, but eventually it will drive the system into some magnetic order phase, which is pretty similar to the 2D deconfined form of critical point B. Sorry, when you say SU3 means the internal space is SU3? Uh, spin it, SU3. Spin, spin, spin. SU3. And that is why you can have a SU3 single as you okay. three spins. It's fundamental in SU3. Yes. Okay. And the 3D order is also SU3? Uh, no, it's still a plug okay. You can, It could be an SU2 SU spin, or if you Okay. Can put in the SU4 spin and they can form a SU4 okay. okay, sorry, then what's the comment you make for 3D BPS order? So for BPS order, it's the same in, inside of because the plaque order can be mapped into a tensor gauge pair which only contains off diagonal components. And that's also a fraton view. So a single charge is conserved on all 2D planes. Single charge cannot move. But a pair of charge as a dipole can move in a 2D plane perpendicular to their orientation. And they can condense, and because they are already 2D, their condensate can give rise to some non order. But but it's a 3D system, but you say it's 2D NCCP1. Uh, the phase transition is similar to 2D because they can only fluctuate within the 2D. They must fluctuate the 2D. So it's almost a decoupled image. So finally, let's slightly talk about uh, some fractal emerge at a quantum critical point. So what I'm considering is a formal critical point between a higher order TI and a trivial phase. So let's, uh, if you don't know what does higher order TI Excuse me, sorry, one step back. So earlier you said that the, the 2D, like uh, this parquet order has uh, transitions quasi 1D, so that uh, it's not robust to this order, phage of this order, mm -hmm. but this one's robust to the order, but 2D. Yeah, it's similar to the 2D. 2D CP. Okay. So, So let's look at a, a simple boson model in 2D square lattice, which is actually akin to the high ordered logical uh, boson version of the high ordered logical disorder. Where on 2D square lattice, we have two four hot core bosons or four spins per side, and each spin is entangled with one of the plaque nearby, so they form a plaque entangled state. So the bond is just the product of all plaque entangled state. And at a smooth boundary, we have two dangling spins which can be paired within the side by some on-site and weak on-site singlet. And uh, at a rough boundary, which is to order, we will always have three spins at the same time. And if you have time reversal symmetries, there's, you can only gap out two of them, and there's still a uh, spin one half zero mode that you have to form. So this is what typical Hamiltonian where everything is entangled in plug A. 
order in bulk. And uh, another state I'm considering is just a trivial on-site singlet because it's the same lattice structure with the same degree of freedom, but because I have four spin per site, then I can just appear every two within the site. Then they just become some on-site singlet, and there's no entanglement between any of the nearby sites. So now I'm considering a phase transition between this phase, which has some corner zero volt, to uh, this phase, which is a direct product state, right, where there's no entanglement between any of the sites. So a typical Hamiltonian I can write down is just a high order TI Hamiltonian, which contains these uh, P entanglement states. Excuse me. Uh -huh. What's the previous, uh, what's the corner with this pyramid? That one. What, what's that one? Mm, okay, that's uh, actually uh, a 3D pyramid lattice where at a at the corner of the pyramid, they zero have bolts. some zero fermion zero bolts. While the other is on the, yes, on the on edge, the will be gap. Yes, on the smooth boundary of the smooth edge. Thank you for the gap. Oh, who, who hook up this system? Um, this is actually not by Titus Newton. I see. Thank you. And the other kind of Hamiltonian is just when we have an outside single Hamiltonian. And now I write these two Hamiltonian together and have a ratio between them to let them compete. And a, when a is one on zero, that just corresponds to we favor a plot a order the state between the side, or we just don't favor an neutral side singlet. And when a is nearly one half, we, as, we assume there should be some competing between these two states. So when a is one half, actually the box state becomes a percolation picture where the domain wall between this plot a integral state. And outside area is the intraside singlet would proliferate in bulk. And this domain wall is something like the boundary between this high order TI phase and the trivial phase. And uh, the green line, uh, the, the blue line is the smooth boundary where all of the neural freedom are fully gapped. But at a rough domain wall, there is a spin one half neural freedom living there. And at a quantum critical region, if they exist, such a kind of domain wall is totally fluctuating which means the wave function is just like a superposition of all possible domain wall configurations. And in the meantime, the corner of the zero mode is also strongly fluctuate with the domain wall. So what does the fluctuation tell us? If we have a domain wall fluctuation, a typical fluctuation configuration is we can flip this domain wall configuration to this domain wall configuration where the domain wall just a slightly shrink along x, x direction. And what it does is, it actually annihilates the spin on pair and will recreate the nearby. And on the lattice model, it actually corresponds to a ring exchange term where the domain wall shrinking actually annihilates this particle pair and move them in a direction perpendicular to their orientation. Or there are other flipping configurations of the domain wall. I can just uh, cut a, a small corner of the domain wall and let it shrink by a corner. What it does is this kind of shrinking configuration annihilate the corner here, but create uh, the other free charge at corner here. Again, the still corresponds to this ring exchange term, which annihilate the charge at corner and create the other charge at the other free corner. So that means when the system is strongly fluctuates, the domain wall is fluctuating and flipping between different configurations, what it induce is it induce a uh, hardcore boson ring exchange term on the square lattice because whenever the domain wall is changing its configurations, it actually changes the location of change the locations of this spin-offs living at a corner of a plot K. So at a quantum critical point, the low energy degree of freedom actually corresponds to this ring exchange term of the hot core boson, or equivalently we can say that at a quantum critical point, there is no single spin-off fluctuation because no domain wall fluctuation fluctuation configuration can transport one spin off to the other direction. It only can correspond to some dipole fluctuation where the domain wall actually transport a pair of dipole in a direction perpendicular to their orientation. So at a quantum critical point, they actually correspond to some spin one half model with a ring exchange term on the square lattice. In this theory, actually, as I just uh, described before, it's actually pretty akin to that uh, algebra quantum liquid phase. And this theory can potentially describe the quantum trivial point between this high order TI and the trivial phase from the percolation picture. And this quantum critical point would be pretty interesting because its entanglement entropy was scaled as L1L, and this is the first uh, 
one critical point in two spatial dimension where the entanglement entropy at a quantum critical region eventually violate the area law at a quantum critical point. In the usual 2D quantum critical point for interacting both on Fermi and with a formula is usually the entanglement entropy is still within the area law. The entanglement entropy only scale that's that's L. So this is the first example where we can have a very long range entanglement at a quantum critical region. And here, actually, we can have subsystem symmetry. Although our UV Hamiltonian I start with, it's still a ring exchange term, and uh, there is no spin bilinear interaction. But once you go, at, go into the quantum critical point, you can slightly turn on some small spin bilinear interactions. And for spin one half model, which correspond to the half field case, such kind of weak spin bilinear interaction or weak subsystem symmetry breaking term turn out to be irrelevant. And here, that means such kind of subsystem symmetry can emerge can be emergent because your UV Hamiltonian still has some weak spin bilinear interaction term. But once you flow into a IR fixed point, the theory again becomes a subsystem symmetric theory. Sorry, just to make sure. That's very interesting. So uh, the DQCP also have a uh, only it's area. Not a of, oh, okay, but, but as for DQCP, this uh, transition will be integral will be also low. L, mm -hmm. True. Uh, this one is alone because it actually has a subdimensional structure. Okay. Is there, any, like is there any kind of a QCP involving Fermi surface? I wonder. Uh, Fermi surface, Fermi surface will, always have L1 L. L. And like true. if you have some boson system with a spin off Fermi surface, that's also L1. L. But, but that, that doesn't happen in the usual critical point. True. Okay. And uh, another the 2D theory, boson theory, which has L1 now, is the sliding Latin liquid. And what they do is, you first just have alignment of the 1D Lattinger liquid, each of them has entanglement, the central charge times low and L. And then you couple them together, but there is no boson uh, uh, bilinear interaction between the chains. You only have a quantized interaction between the chains. And this is what they call a sliding phase. And for such kind of 2D liquid phase, which only have reflection symmetry, you also have such kind of L low and L entanglement entropy. And that's still a liquid phase. And stable against any density wave instability or pairing instability. Very nice. But, but another question. Last time, I want you to say, yes, sorry, one more. Uh, so about this, this uh, figure of this uh, uh, plaquet, what do you try to do for the left and right? What do you try to compare? The one with the uh, ring change term and us the other one. I didn't fully get, sorry. So, so here it's actually, again, First, I have to make a particle hole transformation. That's why the particle operator becomes a whole operator. And because this is a hard core boson, so, so once I create, have a creation operator, because you already have a boson operator, so if I act it, it's again going back to the vacuum. And here it's again creating other hole here of creating a particle here. This is still a ring exchange term for this one. That's only for hard core boson. How about the other one? The other one is actually previously the particle hole period here. And now, because it is shrink, it is moved in the direction perpendicular to the orientation. And you can and also that's the ring exchange. Also ring exchange. Okay. So actually, I'm almost done, and I'm almost running out of time. So actually, let me end up my talk with some interesting future direction. Today, I only talk about uh, emergent fracton behavior in some quantum spin models of bosonic systems, but. Uh, Anyway, I also expect there should be some emergent fracton behavior in some interacting fermion system. If we have an interacting fermion system which contains a incommensurate CDW or pair density wave order, and then such kind of CDW or pair density wave dislocation of this inclination defect, which can potentially carry some charge, fermionic charge to grow freedom, should also have an emergent fracton behavior which is pretty similar to the liquid crystal phase. And uh, although we have proposed some uh, possible fracton algebra quantum liquid in the quantum LP transition, I expect there could be more fracton phase of matter uh, or fracton excitations appear in some first string magnetic materials like iridium materials. The third is uh, about some non equilibrium stuff in fractons. So it turned out that uh, there are something called quantum many body stars where some of the highly excited state will not verbalize. And if we have a fracton phase of matter with subsystem symmetry, it turns out that the number of these 
one of many body scars will scale with the system size and exponential rates, which means there are many scar states, many highly excited states, which does not thermalize. And hence, for such kind of fronton system at finite temperature, we can expect there are some partial thermalization process and the enhanced coherence at finite temperature or even infinite temperature. And that means the fronton is not just an interesting emergent behavior at low temperature. Even high temperature, fronton can give rise to some interesting physics like partial thermalization or enhanced coherence time at even infinite temperature. Okay, thank you. I'll ask you guys to uh, no, 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 have a yeah, lunch together. Yeah, yeah. Wait, have a seat. So, thanks, Isabel, very nice talk. Questions and comments? Actually, this is very interesting. I don't understand. So, uh, what's the concept of CDW and PDW? Why this can happen? So, so uh, a current density would have been charged density wave. Suppose that happened. How is that wave? Can, can happen. And what does that mean by incommensurate charge density wave or current density wave? It's the wave factor. Right. It's, uh, it's a co prime with your lattice right. constant. And then actually, lattice doesn't matter. It almost uh, similar as the continuous theory. And right. just as my first slide talked about, in continuous theory, like liquid crystals, if you have dislocation and discrimination, they are fractals. And for current density wave or charge density wave, their dislocation and discrimination can carry some Marana zero bond. So this is actually some fraton which contains a fermionic parity. I see. But the PDW require a parallel phony surface. Yes. So, yeah. so it can be a fermionic system. Yes, PDW is fermionic yeah. parity at finite yeah. moment, right, so it also right. breaks spatial symmetry. Right. But it will be a fermionic type of okay. And So for thermalizations, previously we assumed there's either ETH or you have MPL, either thermalized at infinite temperature or extremely high temperature, you either thermalize it or you, you just got localized. Partial thermalized means actually many body localization is highly excited states that do not thermalize, they still have by very low entanglement. But partial thermalization or scars is if we like look at the uh, excited state. Some of the excited state has a volume more entanglement, but some of them has a very low entanglement. And hence, by choosing, and hence the thermalization process becomes uh, becomes sensitive to your initial condition. If you start with an initial condition which has some very large non-trivial overlap with the scar state, which will not thermalize, but they are still highly excited state, and then you impose a time evolution at finite high temperature or low temperature, uh, or infinite temperature, then what you will find is you still stay at your initial condition, or if I calculate the auto correlators, you'll find auto correlator will not be decay to zero. Something like a glassy system, but if you start with an um, initial condition, which has no overlap with these scar states, then these state will still eventually thermalize and auto correlator just uh, decay to zero. It doesn't have any memory of your initial state. This is actually known by for many body scars, you need to find the experiment in the case of the output. The final thermalization depends on the initial condition. You expect a fraction of this time, and the high temperature might have a similar behavior. Yeah, so, so scars can exist in many kind of systems, but uh, the, what matters is how many scars do you have. If you just have a finite number of scars stating or highly excited state, it probably doesn't matter that much. For fractal, you will figure out the number of scars uh, grows with your system size and exponential rate. So you have many kinds of scars, and they do affect the thermal ensemble. So, you, which means more easy to find those scars than yes. the high temperatures. That's already been observed. Yeah, it's actually uh, currently the Munich group and the Bobby group already studies so. with scar state and some subsystem symmetric theory of that consideration. Okay, thank you very much. Any more comments, questions? If not, let's thank Isa again for a very nice talk.